call the meeting to order at 6.05. Um, anybody have any adjustments to the agenda? Could we put, because uh, we have guests on, Andrew, can we move the COVID-19 reopening plan to 8.3 and move the other two up so our guests can be first? Sure. Yeah, that'd be fine. Just same order where we do the athletic supply agreement first and then audit. Well, your audit and then COVID-19 so that they, okay. can, they can do their stuff. Sounds good. Do we want to do those? before the reports to the board or do the reports to the board first? Um, I, th if we do, I think we can do the reports to the board first. Okay. All right, um, we'll do that. Um, so we'll swap eight or move eight one to eight four or eight three or whatever. We'll be able to okay. Um, and do we want to assign times and have a timekeeper? I think we can think most of this will go pretty quickly, so I think we can just do our best to stay on on time unless somebody wants to. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Do we have any public comment at this time? Uh, here's Rodney. Okay. Seeing no public comment, we'll move on to the consent agenda of approving the minutes. Um, so have people had a chance to review the minutes from the July 29th meeting? We have uh, any ad adjustments to those or um, a motion to approve them? I'm, I'm okay. I'll second. Okay, so we did Bob motion to approve them and Chris second. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, any opposed? Okay. All right, so we have approved the minutes from July 29th. Um, we'll move on to board comment. Any board comment? All right. So we're right on the number seven um, reports to the board. We'll superintendent report. Let's start with that. So you guys have my report in hand. Um, I'll entertain any questions. Uh, the rest of my updates would come under the committee. The finance committee didn't meet yesterday, and I can give a quick, a quick update with that with a member of that committee. Um, the only other thing I'll mention is is that we've been contacted by 60 Minutes, CBS 60 Minutes, and I've met with them a couple times. Um, they're really interested in our SU's uh, reopening plans and how we're approaching our reopening to use outdoor education. Um, and they've read through the materials we've provided. They feel like it's pretty thorough. And so I'll get, I've met with the producer and the executive producer twice now and we'll find out the first of next week whether or not uh, 60 minutes, 60 on six decides to send a crew up. There'd be two crews to tape um, schools throughout the SU. And right now it looks like they would highlight Rudd Middle School, uh, Tunbridge Central School, and Sharon Elementary School to give our perspective across the SU. So I just wanted to let you folks know that that may be occurring and that would be terrific. So we'll find out. Hopefully the first of next week. Otherwise, I'll entertain any questions you have. It's been uh, busy. Reopening plans are, you know, taking a big chunk of my time right now. And uh, in addition to, uh, you know, just making certain that we are on good financial footing. So those two things uh, tend to eat up, I would say, probably 90% of my time at the moment. All right, well, sounds good. Um, we'll move on to the business manager's report. I don't have a report for you, Andrew. I just have the audit tonight. Right, okay. So we'll move on to the principal's report then. I 
I think it's the same thing. You have it in hand or digitally or virtually. And if you have questions, we're happy to answer. We also, um, as we talked about, we're outlining that with the three big goals that our strategic plan and our continuous improvement plan outlined. And we um, just a quick little highlight. We have met a couple times now with our leadership teams that that you all are, are aware of that we set out last spring. And we've also embedded a few of the plans for how we're going to open. And we're going to talk about those a little later in, in the um, in the meeting. And we have also put in some links to some stories about our school and outdoor education and opening up, which seems to be the um, suit du jour for people. And I would just add that the shared leadership team met this morning for three hours, uh, our second meeting. Um, and one of the main projects we're working on uh, is putting together a COVID handbook to kind of outline how school will be different at the elementary, middle, and high school levels uh, that we can get out to parents and families, uh, hopefully by the end of this week, if not sooner. All right, thank you. Does anybody have any questions before we move on? So we'll move on to the committee update. Finance and system. Well, Andrew, Bob, or Rodney, you can jump in. Um, the finance committee did meet um, we set a regularly scheduled meeting for the first Thursday of the month at five. We reviewed a draft of uh, how we want to go about proposing to the SU that we would budget for a calendar for this upcoming school year um, and discussed a kind of a rotating agenda of what the finance committee will look like, look at monthly. Um, I thought it was a productive meeting and certainly any of you up Members, jump in if you want to add anything more. Well, I, that's the, um, I had called both Bruce and Louise, and they both have agreed to be on the committee. So there'll be two other public members who both have a background in accounting serving on that committee as well. One from Bethel and one from Royalton. Yeah, I thought it was a good meeting and that we have a good roadmap for the work we're going to be doing going forward. So, yeah. What were, what are Bruce's and Louise's full names? Uh, just to get it on the minutes. Uh, Bruce Button. And uh, he owns property in uh, South Royalton. He's Marion and Joe uh, Button's son. They passed away. He went to school at South Royalton. Uh, he presently lives in Concord, Mass, and uh, but he's interested in helping uh, with his accounting background um, with our uh, with our budgeting problems. And uh, Louise Burt is from Bethel, and uh, she's also an accountant and majored in finance. And I don't know a whole lot else about her, but she's uh, involved with town business, I think. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I remember her from some meetings. So great, cool. And when is the facilities committee going to get meeting first? We're going to roll that one in, uh, I believe, in uh, September. Does that sound right, principals? Okay. Any other questions about the subcommittees? All right. We'll move on to the um, athletic supply agreement with Under Armour. I'm going to turn this over to our athletic and activities director. Sorry, Heidi. I don't know if that's your official title. Heidi Wright. It's okay. It'll work. Um, thank you guys for having me tonight. Um, basically, Chris Cook is on the phone um, around video here from Graphic Edge. Um, one of the aspects of things that um, typically 
we see at the high school level now is that high schools um, are signing some form of athletic contract with a, a main brand. Um, once I joined at White River Valley um, and talking to the kids and spending time with the athletes and the coaches and kind of learning and getting the lay of the land, the student athletes are very, very supportive um, to having the name brand uniforms. They very much so want to have Under Armour be that name brand uniform. Um, and Chris is here to help answer questions about what that contract looks like for the school district to sign and become part of um, and kind of how that would work. It will, if we choose to do this, it's something that would save us money moving forward um, as we need to um, start creating some turnover in uniforms. Um, we do technically have a uniform that is illegal. Um, the varsity girls home soccer uniforms are not um, to the standard that they have to be. So in the event that we were able to host a home playoff game, the girls wouldn't be able to use those uniforms. Um, so that is something that we're going to need to move forward and replace. Um, and the reason that they're not legal is because they are not one primary color from start to finish. Um, so um, I really tried to make this something that the kids were supportive to. This isn't just my personal choice. Um, this is absolutely something that's driven by the student athletes. Um, and I, I support them and their desire to want to look good and look sharp and um, help that be something that they can, can move forward with. So you guys have access to the contracts and the specifics of how it works. Um, and Chris is here to, and he's happy to answer any questions that we have as we have as we come forward. And Chris can offer his experience with this as well. So. And before we jump in with Chris, I'll just add to the board that I did as a principal enter into an agreement like this uh, for paid mountain school district schools, both Northfield and Williamstown. Um, and it was successful and it was with Graphic Edge. It wasn't with Chris, it was with another rep from Graphics Edge. And Chris, you can probably remind me who that was, but. Yeah, it was a Carl, was Carl, 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 Carl Laird. Successful partnership. Yeah, so you guys, so Northfield Williamstown did it with uh, Carlton Laird. Um, so what I can tell you about the UA deal is there's quite a few schools in the Upper Valley that have agreed to sign on to the deal or have done, already done the deal. Hartford, Hartford and Oxbow being uh, two close ones uh, to, to you guys. Um, I've found in talking to the ADs that have signed this deal that the kids really do like the, basically the branding idea and being in one specific brand um you know in this case it's under armor um there's a lot of benefits to the plan as well too as you guys can see in the contract under armor is going to give basically a thousand dollars in promo money to start with so basically you can take that thousand dollars and you can buy coaches apparel or you can buy uh t-shirts for the kids or the staff or whatever you choose to do going forward um, you also get 40% off full retail on everything except for footwear, 35% on footwear. Uh, and you also, the more Under Armour that is purchased in the school district, um, you basically, you earn more and more promo money uh, to use uh, in the future uh, with the school as well, too. Um, they do, uh, they do have a, um, uh, they do have the custom uniforms. We can match your school colors. I know when the White River Valley School was first opening, I went over and did a presentation uh, because there were specific colors that we're wanting. So Under Armour is able to match your school colors as well, too, going forward. Um, I think that's about it. If, if you guys need references, I'd be more than willing to give you some references, whether it be at Hartford or Oxbow or St. J Academy or Windsor, for that matter, uh, all those schools have signed on uh, deals with uh, with the Graphic Edge and Under Armour as well, too. Chris, what's the downside? So the downside is basically your uniforms. Um, the uniforms all have to be Under Armour uh, going forward. It's not you don't have to replace them all at once. Um, as I have found out with any of the big three, whether it's Under Armour, Nike or Adidas, uh, you do run into some, uh, like basically some backordered situations. 
Um, so that's the only downfall that I have found uh, thus far with any of the contracts is just potential of back orders with items because uh, Under Armour is, is pretty big right now. So they, they kind of run out of stuff rather quickly, but they also replenish it rather quickly as well too. But if you go to the custom uniform line, then you guys will never ever, you, that, that uniform will never ever run out either. Um, we asked, we asked that basically sideline apparel be Under Armour. So like if we, if we, so say if the Valley News has a picture of Coach Godet on the sideline, we'd like him to be in an Under Armour polo or an Under Armour sweater or something like that. Um, we can't, there's, there's no Under Armour police per se. Basically, I'm the only guy that's going to be looking around to see, you know, what kids are wearing. Um, but there's like the kids, like we can't force you guys to wear footwear. I know it says in the contract that we would like to have you guys in Under Armour footwear, but we can't force that. Um, so the kids can wear whatever they're comfortable with. Um, the basically the big thing is we just want your uniforms and we want your sideline apparel in case there's any any uh, picture or TV potential to be all Under Armour. And some people some people like Under Armour, some people don't. There's no real gray area. So if you have a coach that's not on board, um, that can be a downfall. But in working with different school districts. Uh, for, for example, Hartford, the Hartford hockey coach, does the men's coach does not like Under Armour at all. So we've just kind of said, all right, can you can you at least wear an Under Armour jacket while you're on the sideline? Because he does not like the Under Armour uniforms, and he's agreed to that. Uh, so there's there's some leniency in the contract in regards to you know if certain coaches are like dead set against Under Armour, um, but right now that the main downfall is just potential back orders. Um, and, you know, if, if you have a coach that's dead set against wearing the Under Armour brand. So, Chris, we are not obligated to purchase any type of uniform other than what we, our normal rotation would be for uniforms. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And it, it basically, it's, and it, it starts basically from whenever the contract is signed going forward, we would ask that your uniforms be Under Armour. So you don't have to you don't have to go all the way through like you don't have to replace every single uniform this year and they all have to be Under Armour. It's it's on your cycle as well. And we've we've been able to gradually, be, you know, with Hartford, we we're able to gradually put them into all Under Armour uniforms except for the hockey program. Uh, Oxbow, we were able to gradually put them because they have a budget similar to what you guys are operating with over in White River. Um, and then St. J, you know, I mean, St. J's got more money than God. So they kind of they kind of just went a full bore with it. Um, but yeah, so whenever the site, whatever the new cycle is up. So if the contract is signed and Heidi needs to new, get new girls uniforms, then I would, then we would recommend Under Armour going forward. Go ahead, Rodney. Uh, yeah. I, I just wonder, uh, do, do the athletic boosters have to sell Under Armour products like the t-shirts and stuff that they sell? No, you don't. You you guys would still you guys would still get the discount, Rodney, um, if you guys wanted to, because it, it basically it can go. I have schools that will only do this at the high school level, and then I have schools that will go the entire campus wide, like similar to like St. J. Um, so it's it's totally up to what you guys feel comfortable with. So if the booster club does not feel comfortable selling Under Armour, that's totally fine. Um, you know, we just ask that we get on a bid list so that we can hopefully, you know hopefully give you some apparel options um but yeah you don't you still you still have that discount opportunity but you do not have to sell it if you don't if you don't want to it, rodney i had a conversation with the high school booster club specifically the other night just because we had a, a standard meeting and the conversation that we basically had was that they would move to doing it through graphic edge if the contract was to be signed with the idea that they would offer an Under Armour version and some cheaper, more, or not cheaper, but more economical um, options so that we can keep the designs the same, make sure that the branding stays the same so that the colors are not slightly off. Um, but with the point in that we could offer the Under Armour, but we'd be offering something that wasn't as costly as well to, to be able to cover everything for everybody. You also, Rodney, you also get if the deal is signed, there's a uh, there's a TGE agreement as well too, and basically you would get better screen pricing on some of the more generic stuff too, like a Gildan T-shirt or a Badger T-shirt or whatever you guys would want to do, um, and we do offer that as well too. Like 
for for example, is like not everything at at Hartford is Under Armour. They do they do some shirts for the kids uh, because obviously budget restraints. They just do like a regular Badger or Gildan T-shirt. So you wouldn't have to, you know, you wouldn't have. We'll give we'll 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 suggest Under Armour, but if it's not, you know, if it's not doesn't make sense for your budget, then we'll offer like two or three alternatives as well too, and we'll get you better pricing on screening and embroidery as well. Um. Are we sure that we don't have some kind of agreement with somebody already? Because um, I remember a presentation about Under Armour supporting um, doing our uniforms from a couple of years ago from Sean. We, um, we told we had that discussion, but we never executed the contract. Okay. Uh, we, we followed that up with student discussions. And as we had brand new uniforms at that time, there was no, you know, real impetus to to engage in a contract. So okay. now they're starting to think about replacing the first set of uniforms. The issues come up. Okay. Have Have we priced out like this year's uh, replacement uniforms? And does would the Under Armour contract you know fit within our budget? Sounds like you said it would, but just want to confirm. It, it would come out earlier in the year for me if we signed the Under, Under Armour contract and we were to do the, the nice supplemented uniforms. Um, it ended up being somewhere around $3,500 to, to do one set of uniforms for the home version for the varsity girls. And that fits with the, within what we had budgeted for varsity girls or what you had in mind for varsity girls or... It fits within the line item for the the budget of uniforms for at the high school level. Okay, are there any more questions and on the uh, uniform yeah, contract? This is Lisa. Would it be a? We'd have to have a five year contract with this. Uh, this would be a five year deal if we were to move forward. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. Correct. Yes. And we would have to be spending at least fifteen thousand dollars a year. No, that's basically if that's what we budgeted. We budgeted you guys for because we basically we took numbers from our, from different like schools that are, are based in division lower division three and division four, and that's what we based it off of. If you there's a line in there that if you exceed a certain amount. You'll get more money back from. You'll get more promo money back from Under Armour, but you do not need to spend. You do not need to spend fifteen thousand with Under Armour. That's just basically what we we annually thought that you guys would spend with the Graphic Edge and Under Armour. And the deal includes socks and everything but the shoes, right? Do, do we normally provide socks for the for the athletes? Yes, we provide their their socks. One pair of socks, a home pair and an away pair for soccer. And then for like baseball, softball, they get one pair. They're typically green. And once again, if it's it, with something like that, something like socks, you know, obviously I put, when I give the quote to Heidi, I placed out Under Armour first and then I went to a generic sock. So the big thing is as long as it doesn't, as long as the uniform doesn't have a Nike swoosh or the Adidas three bars, then it, then we'll be fine. Uh, basically, they just Under Armour just wants Under Armour everywhere uh, on the kids. So in case, like I said, in case they're, you guys are televised or make the, the front page of the Valley News. Heidi, are you recommending this? I am. Yes. This is this is the direction the kids want to be going in. They want to be wearing the UA logo um, from kids from, you know, that are participating in track and field to the the bowling team. They want that name brand item. And I, I know it's not right to say that you have to look good to be able to perform well, but to some extent, it's one of those things. They need that swagger of, hey, I get, I'm a cool school. I, I wear or a name brand. Um, my school supports me. This is the backing that I get. I get to wear this. And, you know, I, I understand where they're coming from as high school athletes. Um, they want to look good. 
and the UA uniforms are sharp and we can make them look sharp. Um, when Chris talks about being able to come up with a design and, and have sublimated uniforms, we can make them look and match the colors just like we want. Um, it, and that's the very nice appeal of it. Um, I work really, really hard to make sure that these kids look good in these uniforms and that these uniforms are going to last. It's part of the reason that, you know, at the high school level, I wash all the uniforms at the high school because I want to make them last. Ideally, we have a uniform rotation that goes through and we're replacing them because they're, they're in their rotation period, but the uniforms that are hanging up on the rack still look great. And now we've got alternate uniforms so we can do you know, we can go with a gold shirt for the baseball team because that's what they wanted to do. And we have a green and we have an alternate soccer uniform for home games because the product is a good product and it, and it lasts. And ideally that's where we want to get so that if in the event we have a uniform rip because a player gets cleated in the, the back, I can just call Chris and be like, I need you to replace number 30 for me because the shirt ripped. I asked Jamie, but I'd like to ask one more question. Is the VPA is okay with all of this? Yes. Yeah, they are. We've, we've done several contracts throughout the state, whether it's through Under Armour or Adidas, and we've had no, no kickback from, uh, from the VPA in regards to any of these contracts. Okay. Do, do we need to make a motion or anything? Yep. Yep. I'll move that we sign the agreement with Under Armour. I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion um, to sign the agreement with Under Armour. Is there any discussion? All right. Um, all in favor? Aye. Um, Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Oh, go ahead. Um, question, did, I don't know the last time this topic came up, it was probably the fall of 2018. Heidi was not working in her capacity. Um, though I do appreciate what Reed represented. I can't find the minutes from that meeting. Um, I tried, um, oh, but I, I, I did find them there. Uh, it's um, November 20th, 2018. And it does say that um, the board would or the board asked for Sean to get student feedback and then come back to present to the board with findings. And I didn't find anything else that happened after that, so. That sounds familiar. I don't know if there's any way in the board would request from the, um, the boosters. That was my only public comment. Uh, Heidi, you'd said that you'd discuss this with boosters already? I, I spoke to Jen, who's the president um, of the high school booster club. Um, and you know, she's totally supportive to it. This is what the kids want. Um, and you know, she, she was totally supportive to moving in, in them using graphics so that the designs, the coloring, everything would stay the same. Um, and obviously, and we spoke about them outsourcing for certain things if they needed to. And, and my big thing is that we keep the brand the logo the same, that it's the right colors so that it's not off that way. If somebody's out in public, it's not a slightly different version of what the actual White River Valley logo is. So um, that was my only concern and they were supportive to doing that and following that. So um, they're excited and hopeful that this goes through and that we can move in this direction because they like the kids happy and okay. good in uniform. So. All right. Why don't we take the vote one more time since we're kind yeah, of halfway through? So, all in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, Chris, did, I don't think you unmuted. Aye. Sorry. Okay. Aye. All right. Any opposed? Motion passes. Okay. Um, let's see. Where's our. Have the, uh, we're out to the audit. Right, okay. Moving on to the audit. All right. Introduce to our guests. 
Ron and Josh from RHR Smith, who are our auditors, are on the call with us tonight. Thank you both for being here to assist if there's any questions that you would like to ask. I have forwarded the audit out to all of the board members for review in hopes that you will be able to accept it for a final tonight. Do we have any questions for the auditors right now? I have a question. Um, I understand that um, you are you are uh, paid another sixty thousand dollars on top of the audit. Now, can you explain what happened or why you? Why you? Why that was? Is that correct? That that uh, comment being directed at me? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So so a couple of things. We had a contract with uh, with White River Valley for the audit, and then uh, the the books and many other assistance was needed by White River Valley to basically help put the books together to put the financial statements in that draft that Tara's asked you to approve tonight. Those services were above and beyond the scope of the audit. I don't know what the amount was billed, but we'd be more than happy, you know, to uh, to certainly send you, you know, a detailed invoice of, of of all the work that's been put in in addition to the audit. Yeah, no. I've, um, why was that? I'm new to the I'm new to the board, so. <laughs> The, the, the best way I can explain it is is that there are a lot of reasons, probably, you know, uh, three really at the top of the list. You know, the board went through the, the board, the, the supervisory in, went through a new chart of accounts implementation that was set up and designed poorly. There was just many accounting errors, you know, that led to a lot of struggles, you know, internally, you know, with the books. And uh, I would say that those were probably the first two biggest issues. And then I would just say lack of attention internally, you know, this past year to, to the books, you know, and, uh, and the information that was in there. I mean, there was a lot of errors. There was a lot of things that weren't posted. You know, Tara's sitting there. She can certainly uh, go over what those were. But the, the, the way that those books were given us to audit back in, you know, I would argue September, uh, August, September. And when I sat with you guys all at ha Halloween and went over those financial statements, th those books look totally different, you know, than, than they did when they were given to us on Halloween. And then somewhere around draft number one and two, you know, that you guys got in January to kind of, you know, uh, summarize all the changes and edits. That's the big reasons, you know, for sure. The, the, the books were just in horrible shape. Um, I have, you know, I, I, I've read through just part of the audit and, um, what a, I have a couple of questions. Um, you, um, you redid the books for, uh, 2018. Is that right? We redid the audits for no, 2019. We checked them. Yeah. Okay. 2019. Yeah. Correct. Okay. But someplace along the way, you came up with some new numbers. So 2018, you know, based on the consolidation and based on rebills, which is a whole separate conversation that we went into great deal with special education costs back in 1819, based a lot, based on a lot of information, you know, when you guys in 2019, which, which kind of made a lot of the problems rise right to the top. Um, yeah. I mean, there was a lot of reconstruction, a lot of research, you know, uh, you know, with a lot of things, special ed, as I remember being the biggest one, you know, uh, and, and a lot of it though was at the supervisor supervisory union level. And on a lot of the supervisory union level, if those costs haven't been allocated or allocated correct, as I recall, you know, with, uh, with the districts, there was the, the, the number was remathed, you know, and everything in 2019. And, and, and again, Tara can step in here. I believe all the remath was brought up current to 2019, you know, based on information that we had in 2019. That is correct. Tom. 
Did you do it? There were town meetings that where, where people thought that there was money transferred, and in fact, it didn't happen. Matter of fact, it wasn't even voted on. You know, so there, there, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of work and a lot of I would say uh, reconnaissance. You know, that's been done for the past two or three years as the as the SU and the districts. You know, that merged. You know, and. and including their books with a new chart of accounts. You know, you, you, you asked for the extra billings. There was a lot of, uh, lot of work that was done there that uh, the business office just didn't have the resources to do, you know, and Bruce and Tara engaged us to do it. Did you do an audit of the supervisory union? Is yes, that, we did. Yes. Is, is that in here? No. No, that's a separate audit. Okay. Do you have a copy of that? It's not done yet. What do you mean it's not done? There, we're still working on the finals for the SU's audit. That will go to the SU board. Um, do you feel that this deficit is accurate? Yes. Okay. And, and when we talked, and I know you weren't at that meeting back in October, we oh, approximated the deficit to be about $50,000, depending on, you know, the, the outcome of the final audit for the SU, you know, and, and, and based on the books and based on things being posted where they shouldn't be, all the remath, you know, makes me even more confident that that deficit, as I said back in October, was going to grow. And obviously the unified district was going to be the biggest recipient of that deficit for special ed. You know, there were some, I, I believe, HSA and FSA, you know, health benefits that weren't allocated, you know, that were sitting unallocated. And, 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 and that 350, we believe, captures everything. You know, I, I heard the comment that the SU isn't done. The SU actually is done. It's actually in your hands, you know, and I think Tara and her people are just working out the math on the numbers to give it another check. But we're, we're confident, you know, and, and Tara, I don't know what draft that is on the SU. I know I saw an email from you earlier, you know, to Kathy and her group, and they're going to huddle up and just make sure that, you know, that we're all on the same page and, you know, and that all the, the math been rechecked again and again and again. Uh, we don't expect any big changes. I think that we have exhausted the SU and all the member districts to the point where we're at that deficit right now. My concern, you know, as I've uh, shared with uh, Jamie and Tara, is it, it, that numbers as of over a year ago, I'd be more interested if on the respective boards on what it is today as we sit uh, here and speak. And that's really where the sense of urgency is for us and has been for really for the past three or four months. I agree. Um, and I think there's a lot of work. And I, I, Tara, you can hop in here. And I know Rose has done an admirable job, really doing a lot of uh, a lot of research and working with Bill and Kathy and Jordan. I just don't know where you're at in 1920, but I think that that's really where all the energy needs to be refocused on you all right now. Where are you today? That was a year ago. Where are you today? Yes, we are working yes. through all of our FY20 year-end closures. We are doing all the account reconciliations that you did on our behalf for FY19. We are handling that all in-house now. And those have all been projects that we have been working on for the last several months and making sure that all of those things are where they need to be and all the allocations are done appropriately, all the district billbacks are done appropriately. So that is all part of the year-end closure process that we're going through right now. And, and Tara, my concern is, and, and Josh, you can weigh in here too. My concern is, is I just don't think you have the resources in house based on what we've seen so far in the pre-audit, Tara, to get there as fast as you're going to need. And I just know this board and all the other boards, you know, and Jamie, you know, we made a conditional promise to Jamie, hey, we're ready for December 1st, you know, but you guys got to be ready. Tara, I think you guys really need some help you know, in those reconciliations. And I'll let you and Jamie talk about how you huddle up in that. I know Josh and I have some concerns, you know, just as far as your readiness now, you know, and the fact that we, there's, there's no time to delay, you know, because the further you move, you know, from June 30th, Tara, I think it's gonna be harder, you know, to really make business decisions, so. Do you know what kind of help she's looking for? I'd argue probably, I, I think that Jamie, Tara, and uh, um, uh, Rose could huddle up on that one, but I would argue similar help, hopefully not in the magnitude of the year before, you know, that we had, but I, I would say pretty 
similar to the year before because there's probably six months into 2020, you know, where really Tara and the and, and Rose didn't get their hands on. And, and, and Josh, correct me if I'm wrong. I know Rose is still trying to to keep up with the pace and try to keep up with uh, with, with, with trying to get current, you know, so that we can actually, you know, be productive for 20. Correct. Yeah, that's right. They're working on the reconciliations now. I, I spoke to her today. Tammy, I want to mention, I saw that that draft of the audit went to you. It shouldn't have until the board approves that. That's not for public. Uh, you're still muted, Tammy, if you're responding. Ron, is there anything in this, like, audit that, I know there's a lot of things, you know, there's a lot of things that stand out, but is there anything that really stands out that we need to take care of? So, so, so I'd say a couple of things, and I'm just going to go back to October 31st and kind of, you know, be delicate what I say. I, I think there were some some personnel issues, you know, in the past and capacity issues, you know, with the personnel. And clearly a lot of things happened in this audit right here that you guys all have in front of you now for 19, where, like I say, everything just floated to the top and just caused some huge challenges internally, you know, that uh, that Tara walked into. You know, having said that, when I met back in October, I think that the biggest challenge, you know, for that SU and the districts was really getting some accounting help in there. And I think Rose was a great hire, you know, just seeing, you know, just seeing her ability and capabilities. And I think that that was absolutely a necessity for the district. Seeing what we've done now and just kind of the delays and the, the research and time that's gone in with Tara and her department, I would argue probably I, I, I think it's time for Jamie and Tara to, to huddle up again and look at the business office and and I think that you guys definitely need some more accounting support in that office. Uh, can you tell me whether or not there's a deficit in the central office? I believe the answer to that when you say central office we're talking about the supervisor union correct? Right. Yeah, well, so so I believe the answer yes, the, yes there was, and and again when we talked about the math and the remath, that deficit, what happens is it gets reallocated to all the districts. So in theory, that supervisory union should reset itself to zero on June thirtieth of every year. The problem is this past year you were probably a year and a half behind in processing information, and just now you're getting caught up to nineteen, and 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 we're concerned the further that you get away in twenty. For from, from June 30th, all that math has to be reassessed to the districts, you know, and I'm just not, I'm not sure what those numbers are. Maybe Tara has numbers, but the concern is, is, is that we don't know what the numbers are when we really need to, like, like now. Yeah. So that we can reassess. Well, Ruth and Bethel own 40% of that. And that's and like I say, they were the biggest recipient of some of those unallocated expenses that we talked about at the supervisory union back in October. You know, 40, 40 plus percent, 42 percent. I can't remember what the math worked out. But as I said back in that meeting, whatever that math is, the unified district is the biggest recipient of a deficit. And that's all we we have that now. We just don't have it as a board. But you've given it to the central office. I do yeah, not Tara, I think you've. I don't you've have seen the everything, last correct? draft, Ron. The last draft I What's have was prior to all the changes we've made in the last couple of months. That's what yeah. I know. But I, I believe. Say. I think the question was asked, though, Tara, do you have all your drafts? The answer is yes, correct? It's just nothing more than research that's going into these now, correct? I don't have a revised draft after the changes that we've made. Right, but but my, but my 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 you have your drafts though, correct? Barring the changes, you've had drafts, you know, in the past that we're working on to make those edits too, correct? Yes. Okay, for all of them, correct? Yes. And now the SU, like I say, the SU really drives whoever's asking the questions. The SU is really the big driver because that's the math that needs to be reassessed. But I, I, I think whatever the reassessment is now, you know, with, with our people working with your people, you know, um, you know, I, I think it's down to, you know, it's, it's not down to thousands of dollars now, folks. It's down to hundreds of dollars. So. Um, 
as far as if the um, business office needs more accounting help, that's something that'll have to be brought up at the SU board level. Which... We've got a, a state of the state affairs and finance on the SU agenda for Monday. Good, perfect. Do we have any more questions? And listen, if you all want me to participate in that and have a similar dialogue, you know, I, I think Tara, wasn't that board, was, weren't most of them at that meeting, you know, back in October on Halloween? Was that the SU board or executive committee? I don't even remember now. You met with the executive board and yeah. some, several of the full board members came to that meeting. But we do have, I think, three or four new board members that joined in March at town meeting. Bob being one of them, as he indicated, throughout the SU. Did you, Ron, did you meet with the uh, Bethel South Rolton board? I don't believe so. So let me tell you who Bruce gave permission for at least like three members. And I don't even believe that they were that they were board members at the time. Maybe they are now, you know, but back then that they weren't. I've talked to a lot of people from there, all with Bruce's blessings, you know, with, uh, you know, from them just to kind of give the state of the state of the district, you know, the unified district, the SU, you know, et cetera. You know, there were some. You know, there's some things that were discussed at meetings that I wasn't privy to, that I wasn't asked to. So they asked for some clarification. I honestly don't know where those representatives were. I can take a look at my emails and forward those to Jamie, and he can uh, pass those on to you all. I've asked Ron to join us on Monday evening as well. Yeah, I think when we had one of the original drafts, Ron was on the phone with us explaining what some of the different lines were. Um, but uh, and that was all pre pre COVID. So it was just over the phone versus like a Google meet like this. Special Ed, I recall, was being the biggest one that needed to be reallocated. And, and, and the unified district took the big hit for that one. Ron, are you available if I wanted to talk to you on the phone? I'm going to leave that up to you. If if if, if Jamie has no problem, you know, as Bruce didn't, I'm I'm more than happy to talk to anybody. My hands extended to anybody. So. Well, I'd like to read through this complete um, audit, and uh, I do have a few questions, maybe, and I'd I'd like to. Talk I'm more than happy to answer for you or anybody who wants to have a conversation. For sure, more than happy. Try not to take much of your time. Listen, no, no, no worries. I think it's important, you know, especially from, you know, from where this place has been and where it's trying to go and the work that it's trying to do to get there. I think now there's no time like the present to do it. So. Okay. Josh, anything you want to add with the pre-audit and the works and conversations you've had with Rose and Tara? Uh, no, I don't think so. Not at this time. I really think what we all ought to do, you know, and, and as I said this to Jamie and Tara, we really, you, you know, and, and like I say, I think it's actually important time. We should be probably doing some kind of a monthly status check here. And, and I think a five minute or a 10 minute you know, phone calls we've done with some other supervisory unions that we do, you know, that have had some problems, you know, that that just a regular, hey, how are we doing? Are we making any progress? We're more, Josh and I are more than happy to extend our hands to do that because I think that that needs to be done more frequent, especially as you're coming into budget season all over again. Well, do we have any more questions about the audit specifically? And do we want to try and accept it tonight? Anybody? Well, I think there's a lot of work, a lot of work that's gone into this. This is just royalty. I, I suspect you've done the other districts too. And, and uh, you know, I'm willing, I'm willing to approve the audit. I mean, I haven't read it all the way through, but it seems like a lot of work's gone into putting it together. Do we have a motion? I'll move to accept the audit. I'll second. 
Any discussion? All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, we've accepted the audit. The motion passes. Thank you both for joining us. Yeah, thank thank you. you. You're welcome. Listen, everybody, take care. Have a good one. Talk to you on Monday. <laughs> All right. Um, so now we're on to what was 8.1, the COVID-19 reopening plans. So I'll, I'll kick it off and then I'm going to turn it over to the principals. They've all been working incredibly hard at the building level um, and with Shane Oaks to ensure that we have a safe and effective reopening of schools. Uh, tomorrow there'll be another updated communication coming out from the SU that discusses um, expectations around students who are attending in-person instruction around wearing face masks and other and completing health screenings. And we're gonna ask that guardians and students sign an agreement that indicates that they understand that health screenings have to happen daily, that face masks have to be worn at all times when they can't safely social distance outside. Um, so that, that there's no gray in that. I, when we're talking about safety, I think that needs to be black and white. And so that is going out and we're going to expect that that is signed and completed prior to students attending in-person instruction. Um, in addition to, we got some other updates that are coming out in regards to athletics and Heidi is still on the call, I think. So she can give an update around that. I met with Shane and Heidi um, in regards to athletics earlier today. Um, we continue to feel good about our transportation plans. I was in contact with the transportation company twice today. Um, I think we've got good plans in place to transport students across the SU, including to our tech centers. Um, and I know Reed and Owen have been wor we're working on the crossover transportation. Um, as far as their virtual academy goes, those numbers did um, creep up over the last few days, although we're still um, well under in the K through eight level of the 20% uh, that folks have been seeing and other SUs, I believe the high school may be at 20% virtual, um, but the elementary schools are much lower than that across the SU. Um, so I feel good about the fact that I think we can staff it creatively across the SU um, and have teachers focused uh, purely on virtual instruction in grades K through five um, and we've got uh, Owen and Tracy Thompson are meeting with Lindy Stetson to talk about how we can staff the middle school virtual academy. I feel good about the kind of draft plans I worked out with Lindy and Tracy around that. Um, and as you know, you just heard, uh, we're, our fiscal position is not great and the CARES money we're trying to be very careful with. So I'm really looking at how do we share resources across the SU to tackle this and have two high quality programs, both in person and virtual. And I'm feeling confident that we're gonna be able to do that. Um, we, uh, I will say that the RUD um, faculty and staff are definitely reaching out in regards to utilizing the supervision that we're providing. Um, and so that's gonna ensure that we're able to keep some of our highly qualified teachers in front of students. And, um, you know, I just want to put a shout out to all the faculty, staff, administrators who have been working tirelessly over the summer. As we get ready to open with in-service uh, next Thursday, I'm able to sleep at night feeling like we're going to have a really safe and effective plan for reopening on the 8th. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to read and we're going to go down through each of the, the grade level clusters around what those specific plans are. Reed, you wanna take it over? I will, yeah. And I'll, I'll reemphasize what Jamie just said, is I, I think there's a high degree of comfort with our staff, with the plans we have in place. The, the types of uh, stories you see on the news about teachers organizing protests and that sort of thing uh, is not at all the case with our faculty. Uh, some of, the, some of the tension with the high school staff is they're really concerned that they're not gonna have as many minutes with our hybrid plan uh, with their students as they would like to have. Uh, so we, you know, it's an interesting conundrum to have. 
Um, with the, the results of who's registered for the virtual academy, we now know that at the high school, 20% of our students will be learning all remotely through first semester uh, of the coming year. Uh, so that with one fifth of, of the students, that looks like 10 ninth graders, 10 11th graders, and 11 11th and 12th graders. Uh, because we have 10 ninth graders and 10 10th graders, that gives us enough to cohort those students for their core academic classes. So our plan is to create 13 to 15 virtual sections from our existing faculty. We'll have two English teachers, two math teachers, two history teachers, two science teachers, all to teach their normal ninth or 10th grade class, teach that virtually to the group of students in the virtual academy. Uh, so I'm, I'm feeling good that that's gonna keep our costs for, for running this virtual academy under control without having to really add much staff or, or extra cost. Um, we're looking at having about five elective classes um, where we've had low enrolled electives, say, uh, uh, what's a good example? Uh, we might take an art class, one of the low enrolled art classes and try to create a virtual art program. We, we haven't figured out what that's gonna look like. Um, we, we think we can run maybe the health class, which is a graduation requirement and offer that for a semester remotely. Um, so what we're doing right now, we started work on it yesterday when we got our numbers and we'll continue tomorrow morning, is take the master schedule and reallocate staff and staff uh, to make sure that we're fulfilling all our contractual obligations with the association uh, and trying to create the best schedule that, that fulfills students' choices for classes. Um, in order to make that happen with the virtual academy, especially with 11th and 12th graders, whose interests in course needs uh, are gonna be a little more diverse than 9th and 10th graders, we'll rely on 25 slots we have at the Vermont Virtual Learning Cooperative. Um, and we're really gonna encourage 11th and 12th graders to take advantage of the two, two college classes they can take through Vermont's dual enrollment program. So hopefully that'll put a cap on the number of classes we might have to pay for uh, in tuition to get kids the classes that they wanted. You know, for example, I was taught emailing a student who wants to take an AP English class. Uh, we just got to figure out where it's going to be cost effective for her to enroll in that. Uh, and Jamie suggested uh, Brigham Young has some virtual classes that in some cases are less, much less expensive than what Ver Vermont Virtual Learning Cooperative has. So we'll, we'll probably look at some other online schools to provide you know, some of the fill-in courses that we need to get kids exactly what they want. For the, um, for the high school classes, is there gonna be kind of flexible pathways options for students who want to do yep. like independent studies or something like that? Absolutely. So so for some of the 11th and 12th graders, uh, I, I fully expect some of them may have some community based work that they're doing uh, and we'll have them hooked up with the work based learning program and doing that remotely. Um, another example is uh, we've decided with all the concerns about singing in person that chorus will be a virtual class this year. and We've got a plan plan for that. So students in the virtual academy will be able to take virtual chorus, just like the in-person students will be uh, in virtual chorus. Uh, and the way that will look is that uh, the chorus students will have a place to go and sit when they're in the building, but they won't have chorus. But when they're on their remote learning day, they'll have a, a small kind of private group voice lesson with the chorus instructor. Reed, have we worked out all the details within the Pathways program for them to be assigned core content area proficiencies? We have not done that yet. Okay, no. but that's in the works? Uh, we actually were, were talking with a student uh, who's enrolled at Hartford uh, Tech Center, and we're working on that with an English teacher last night, yeah. We, uh, codifying it into a system is, is uh, and, and who's going to staff that is the... Uh, it's important, but it's probably not as important as getting kids into their schedules for the first day of school. So <clears throat> it'll 
probably be more on a case by case basis to start. Are all the kids scheduled, Reed? The no. What, what we're having to do, Bob, is we're we're ha in order to create the online sections. Now that we know how many kids we have, we we have to close down an equal number of sec. You know where we. We're going to take faculty out of our in-person schedule. So instead of having uh, four freshman English classes, we're going to have three in-person freshman English classes and a fourth virtual freshman English class. But what that means is we have to take the students who are virtual and we have to take them out of the regular schedule and we have to create sections of virtual classes and move those students into those classes. But to do that, we have to go into each of those 30 students course requests, and we have to then manually reprogram them into the courses that they want. So we've, we've got a lot of work to do. I, I'd like to think we'll be done with it by the end of the week, but I, I don't know that, that, that we have the capacity to do that that quickly. Well, Reed, I'm just going to jump in, having been a high school principal recently, and say I know how difficult building the master schedule is in general. And the fact that you've been thrown this curveball and how you and your staff have thought outside the box to make this possible, just thank you. Yeah, a lot of the work's going to fall on, on Hannah Romeo's shoulders as she tries to work this out, and she's a little worried. <laughs> but I'm, sure, I'm confident that we'll, we'll put it together and it's going to work out for the kids, and kids will feel good. You know, it's an interesting mix. Uh, many of the kids who've signed up for the Virtual Academy were successful and really liked that model last spring. Uh, then there are a lot of other kids who just don't like coming to school so much who are there. And you know, we're a little worried about how remote learning uh, entirely virtually uh, is going to work for them. So we, we also are looking at uh, using our student assistance program professional counselor uh, as a virtual academy counselor to do some work with those kids to make sure they're staying motivated and organized with their online coursework. So that's that's what I've got. Unless you have any questions. All right, your turn, Owen. Yep. Good afternoon, evening. Welcome. Uh, I'll try to be as succinct as possible, but I want to share something with you, just to give you a sense of what we're doing. Okay, so. If you can see right here, this is our draft of how we're going to do our mixed model at the middle school. And we held a parent meeting. The teachers are working on this, and it will flip-flop. This might get you a little seasick, so bear with me. So this is our Mighty Oaks. And if you look that they are remote learning the first three days of the week, and they're on campus the Thursday and Friday. The opposite team, the Maples, is our in person on campus the first two days of the week and the remote the last three days of the week. So that gives you a sense and it breaks down how we're going to be doing things. And I'll let you know that we still have sixth, seventh and eighth grade. We have 128 students. 14 students have signed up for the virtual academy. We have great numbers, which makes uh, about 41 kids per grade level on average. And we're going to use we're going to create pods when they're at school. <clears throat> those pods will be, we have nine of those, and they'll average 13 to 14 right in there, uh, kids per group, and two adults with each group. Those groups will be, t stay together when they're on campus in tents, and we've already, uh, the tents are in the queue to bring forward, and we have those, and we're going to have some other tents for the elementary, which Andrew will address. So when they're at school, they'll be working outside. And when they need to be in like out of the sun or out of the rain, they'll be in these tents. They'll also be using the woods. And they'll, on their off days, they'll be doing the majority of their uh, traditional learning, air quotes, where they'll be doing uh, math, English, science, social studies. They'll also be doing uh, the essential special pieces each afternoon remotely. And in the, the program during the day when they're on campus, they're going to do a couple things specifically. They're going to be reading and writing, but they're also going to work within the woods and learn about the woods and biology. And they're also going to work 
on a passion project that the team develops. So a big piece of this is about team work and team development and about their social emotional connection. We've created the model so that they're in a group of students that is not their advisory. They'll still be assigned to their advisory and they'll connect with the advisor on the remote days. There'll be one full advisory meeting on Wednesdays. So now they'll have two sets of kids they'll be connected with. So we've, we've almost doubled their time with different kids, one, in pers one set in person and one online that they have relationships with already. Um, let's see. I think that's probably enough right now, and there may be some questions or comments. We had a meeting the other night with parents, and I think we had about 30 parents show up, and we had, I think, a half dozen teachers, and we're going to try to hold another one of those before we open. Questions, comments? Uh, yeah, I, I was just wondering, <clears throat> when you were sit, talking before, you said something about using the churches or the mm -hmm. hall, town hall and whatnot mm -hmm. uh, later on when the weather gets bad. But would, why wouldn't they just be able to go back into classrooms at that time? And then the other thing I was wondering is, uh, I know we're getting some federal money for COVID-related projects. You know, would it be possible to put like an air exchange system in the uh, school building? So those are two big questions. And first, the one about off-site or in-building, we've changed our thinking on off-site. It's still an option that's available, but we've figured out how we can have people in the building if necessary, okay? We're also not doing portalettes. That was, uh, and there's a good, lot of good reasons for that. Nice, Tammy. And uh, we're gonna have, we're gonna create a um, bathroom program. Yeah, it's, I mean, there's a lot of operations with this, and I'm sure you know that at all levels of how kids arrive at school, how they leave at school, how they get food, how they move around the building. There's a lot of logistics, and that's all being figured out with um, the principals and teachers. So as far as, what was the other one that you asked about? The air piece. Yeah, we, um, I don't think that we, we actually have reviewed, had our all of our hair, air handling reviewed at both buildings. And we're putting in uh, MERV filters, and I'm told these MERV filters, probably Chris knows about this a little bit. These are like high quality filters that filter out a lot of stuff. We've had all of our HVAC cleaned and we're going, we usually change those filters. My understanding is once a year and we're gonna change those three times a year this school year, okay? Other questions or comments? In the efficiency of Vermont, I've spoken to them. I feel pretty confident that that, that grant that came out is going to cover most of the upgrades throughout the SU once that money's released. So when it's released. So, Do so we have the, sorry. sorry uh, one, one of the things we've been working with Efficiency Vermont with uh, and Control Technologies, our HVAC vendor, uh, is what it would take to come up to the, the full standards, which is a MERV 13 filtration system. Uh, and currently, our filters only our our vents only have the capacity to run MERV eight filters, uh, and uh, what that means is taking standalone HVAC units that are built into the walls of each classroom. Uh, and there are thirteen of these on South Royal on the South Royalton campus. We would we would seek grant money to try to replace those with the same computerized system that can do higher capacity room turnover uh, and handle uh, tighter filters. Uh, but that, you know, that'll be a, a six figure uh, grant item, probably in the 12, 120 to $140,000 uh, range. So who knows if the states put aside enough money for all those projects. Probably not. <laughs> Do yeah. we have statistics for how often the room air gets changed for the current system? I don't have that. You're, You're muted. muted. You're muted. For, for the new parts of the South Royalton system, uh, they've been programmed uh, to, I believe it's eight room circulations an hour uh, because we have the capacity to do that. Uh, so it's up to the COVID regulations. That's the main entrance, the office spaces, the gyms, the locker rooms. 
uh, but the the older parts of the buildings we don't we don't have that and the the in classroom vents manage air changeover percentage of outside temperature in trying to use outside air efficiently to heat or cool the rooms uh, so it it kind of depends on the time of day and we don't really have the the manual control to, to control room turnover. So I think the, the plan is to have windows and doors open and, and use fans to change the air over more than it would otherwise. Is it, that is the plan. <laughs> it's not uh, systematize how we're gonna best do that, but uh, that's our thing. Andrew's turn. So I feel like we sort of presented the last board meeting what the, the day would look like for elementary students. Um, and so I'll just do a brief recap, but um, we've been working really hard about what it's gonna look like as kids arrive. We did a lot of standing in the parking lot today talking about um, entrances and, and how we we're gonna quickly health check people to get them in. So kids will arrive um, between eight and 8.30 on buses and by cars, we'll be health checking them. Um, the first half hour of the day, all elementary uh, classrooms are gonna participate in a morning meeting where we're gonna really focus on Second Step, which is a program that the Royalton Elementary has been using. Uh, we're also gonna be using some, some materials that we've uh, borrowed from Mr. Canardi's previous schools uh, that are based on Michelle Garcia Winter's work on, um, now I'm missing it, but, uh, but it's all about social. Oh, my YouTube work. Andrew, I didn't know you were doing that. Yeah. Cats out of the bag. <laughs> we're doing that on both campuses. So we're really gonna be working on building our community, even though we're gonna be very separate. So through this morning meeting, we're gonna launch into academics um, as much as we can. Uh, so focusing on literacy and the processes we've been using in literacy um, and math. We're piloting a new program on the Royalton campus this year, which is exciting. Um, so all classes will be using iReady Math, which is new. And, um, We'll be doing as much as we can outside on the Bethel campus. We're lucky because we have the overhangs. We're gonna utilize that as more than tents. We do have retained one tent for the playing at the, in the field and having separate spaces. In Royalton, we're getting a bunch of tents so that we have um, shade and the ability to be outside more as well. So academics are gonna wrap up at 1.30 and then we're gonna move into an enrichment uh, afternoon to three, it's gonna be in conjunction with some of the One Planet staff, and we're trying to tease out exactly what that's gonna look like. I know a lot of parents have more questions about that right now, and we have had a meeting this past week and are having another meeting tomorrow, uh, Thursday morning rather, to finalize information about that. We're hoping that welcome back letters are gonna be going home Monday with um, something that tells talks about what that enrichment block will look like. Also, we will still have One Planet. Uh, at three o'clock. So parents have the option to pick up their kids at 1.30 before the enrichment block. And then we'll have also another option to pick up their kids at three o'clock, um, or they can sign them, send them on home on the bus, or they can sign them up for one planet. Uh, all classrooms have a partner teacher or a buddy teacher as a backup plan. Um, what else do I wanna say? We're scheduling virtual parent meetings for next week. So on the 25th will be for grades three, four, and five. On the 26th will be um, for pre-K. And on the 27th will be for grades K-1-2. Um, we also are gonna schedule some classroom tour nights, which will be really brief, um, very socially distanced, 10 minute walks through the room with the teacher. Uh, those will be, and we're also going to go through the temperature dry runs and so parents can also see like how they're going to have to pull into each campus to, to drop off their kids. Um, so those will be the evenings of September 2nd for the grades 3, 4, 5 and evening of September 3rd for pre-K, K, 1 and 2. So there'll be more information coming out about all of that. Um, but that's what we've been working on. We are wrapping up our work on the COVID handbook that we're going to get out to parents. Um, right now, I just sent it to the staff today to poke holes in it to make sure it's ready to go. Uh, we're making designated bathrooms, um, welcome signs on all the exterior doors, just everything you can think of we're trying to think of, how to socially distance little people who don't always stay separate. Happy to entertain any questions. This is Lisa. I'm just wondering what kind of um, 
Are there going to be chairs out in the tented areas or the outdoor areas? Obviously, kids aren't going to be wanting to stand all the time. And how are you going to be doing that? So it depends, I think, on the teacher. Um, we've talked, some teachers really are more comfortable with kids having chairs and, and a desk-like area to sit and write at. Um, I know some teachers have already purchased some sit stump like uh, pillows for kids to sit on. Um, in Bethel, again, it's concrete around most of the building that we will have access to for sitting on. If it's nice, obviously there's some grass too. In Royalton, it's it's a more of a grassy terrain. So we're being really flexible and I think I'm gonna work with teachers on what their preferences to have. If they need things, we're trying to meet them with their needs in the most economical way um, and be flexible. So it's not a straight up answer. I feel like this, this is really silly, but we've even had this detailed conversation about pencil boxes just because everybody can't share anymore, right? There's no bucket of crayons for everybody to reach into. Um, so we're just trying to do what's comfortable for teachers and what they think is going to function the easiest. I also can address the middle school part of that. <clears throat> and currently, and I, I need to be clear, and I think you probably know this, things are changing rapidly. So what we present with you today, and these are the details that we as administrators and teachers, this is our business, right? But it's a good heads up for you. We're talking about creating <clears throat> through the shop with uh, Ms. Brainerd, creating kits that students would put together seats. That would be part of their some of their first work at school. And these chairs would also have little storage space in them. So they could put their daily stuff in that chair and also some some uh, something flat to write on. So this is all part of the building into the process of how to be a team and also how to do things together. And it's embedded math, if you will. I mean, I know anybody that does any woodworking, it's measure twice, cut once, or I always do the cut twice, measure once thing and get it wrong. But <clears throat> so that's how we're gonna address that right now, Lisa. But that could change if we find that there's a, a different, better way to do this. <clears throat> It sounds like everybody's about one step away from each child having their own little chalkboard to write on. Well, right. that may happen still. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a lot of times in classrooms, they have whiteboards, little personal whiteboards. Mm -hmm. So a great way for a lot of things, including communicating with your teacher. So that might be something that comes along here. Mm -hmm. So we heard briefly about um, chorus in the high school is there any instrumental music plans for this year yeah andrew uh josh Pauly uh has been been reviewing the national music association's guidance uh and reading every piece of of data from research that he can on on how covid spreading and how musicians are dealing with it um and he he wants to give it a shot uh, so we are we are keeping concert band in the high school schedule. Uh, it will, at the very least, will start outside on the soccer field with kids at least 10 feet apart. Um, and we have we are in the process of ordering. I, I think they're called instrument socks. Uh, so they're cloth covers to put over the the openings of the instruments, so the aerosols and particulates can't travel or they're you know cuts down on them. Uh, the other thing that they're using for uh, music is uh, split uh, face mask. So a mouthpiece can go to the face mask. And when air is sucked in by musicians, which is where some of the danger comes from, is when they in take a big, abnormally large inhalation, they can pull in particulates from farther away than a kid just sitting in a classroom. So by having that mask around the mouthpiece, will cut down on some of what they're able to inhale uh, and exhale too when, when they don't have the mouthpiece in. So uh, we're gonna give it a shot. Uh, if, if it doesn't feel safe, uh, we've got a backup plan of turning everyone into percussionists and having just a huge uh, drum line with the kids on field drums and all sorts of percussion instruments. So we're gonna see what we can do. Another piece to be aware of is <clears throat> we're trying to limit the interaction of people. So part of this, some of this will be virtual and some of it, 
because moving people between campuses becomes an issue for a lot of reasons. There will be some, of course, and uh, moving people around the building. So we're being really thoughtful about that. We haven't figured out the details. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with John Cage and his music that has silence in it. We're going to try to do a lot of that in the middle school. Um, at the elementary level, that's when they, you know, first get introduced to instruments. And I know probably doing um, group things probably isn't in the cards, but it might still be a good idea to facilitate getting the kids instruments so that they can start working individually on things just so that they're not completely missing a year. And just Our music talk. teachers are all over this, good. as you might imagine, as the experts. Can Heidi jump in and just give a quick overview of how we're approaching fall athletics? And she stuck on for me. We met today. We did. Want to a brief overview, Heidi. Yep. Uh, so the VPA passed out their recommendations last week on Tuesday, and then we had uh, 24 hours to kind of go through that before all the athletic directors jumped on from the state to do a conference call. Um, basically, we just kind of reviewed um, what the VPA's direction was given from the AOE, the state, um, Department of Resources, and all of the input that came about from the state level. Um, and basically, we're going to move forward with fall athletics. Um, they will look different. Um, you know, face masks will be worn. Um, we've made uh, Jamie... Shane and I met today with some other members of the SU who are involved in athletics and basically kind of took the guidance from the VPA and the state and added our um, additional things to it that our SU is going to require. Um, so face coverings will need to be um, two ply. Um, and uh, I've pushed really, really hard that we limit the amount of people that will be able to be in attendance for athletic events um, to two people per athlete um, for a number of different reasons. And one of them is that, you know, we also have to kind of look at special events. Um, I understand we're in COVID and we need to do everything to remain safe as much as possible. But, you know, when the senior games roll around for these senior athletes, um, if we get to that point, um, I want to be able for them to have additional family members there because these are, you know, once in a lifetime moments that are important that we honor and we try to keep um, as intact as we possibly can. Um, how we attempt to make this all work um, from what time you need to be at practice so that kids can go home to change so they're not clogging up the or having multiple people in the locker room at the same time. Um, and just putting in those different safety precautions. So ideally what I'm proposing to do, and I'm in the process of finalizing everything from an SU athletic COVID standpoint um, with the help of Shane to get out to families so that people know so that they can make their informed decisions on if they want their student to participate in athletics. But basically practices will start no earlier than 3.30 in the afternoon. So kids have the opportunity to go home and change if they can. Um, and they have to be masked up the entire time. Um, the only athletes that don't keep a mask on during competition are cross country runners. Cross country is gonna look different. How the starts are gonna happen hasn't been released yet from the cross country committee. Um, once all of that stuff comes into play, I will absolutely pass it along. Ideally, we're gonna start in step two, which means basically we're gonna have um, five days at step two where we can practice. If and when we move to step three, you'll get an additional five days to practice where you could potentially scrimmage other schools. Once we move past that you know, 10th practice, they'll be able to start competing. We'll pick up the schedule where we are based on the date. Um, they're extending soccer season by one week um, with the idea that if everything goes well, we would play the September 15th week schedule in October, um, just picking up those games. Um, realistically, I think best case scenario, the high school is going to look at somewhere between eight, to nine games um 
middle school, my proposal was to have four games. Um, middle school schedule is usually shorter than the high school schedule. Um, and ideally, we would spend a majority of the time at the middle school level focusing on practice and learning the skills and doing drills to get better. We'd play a few games. Um, we'd keep those local. Ideally, the high school schedule, because we're part of the Southern Vermont League, we will still remain relatively local. Um, you know, and, and make that work out. Obviously, if a school has an outbreak or, and we were scheduled to play a game with them, we're not going to go play a game with them. Um, you know, kids that are remote on the day of practice, you know, they'll have to go through the health screening. Um, either myself or the coach will be doing that. Um, and we're going to try to make sure there are no gaps. And, you know, when you come to school, you're going to have that same health protocol that you have to go through to come to participate in athletics for that day. Um, the hope is that the decision about anything moving further for winter sports will come out somewhere around October 15th. Um, you know, but bass fishing is a go cross country is a go and soccer is a go. And those are the, the programs that we offer. Um, I have had parents reaching out, asking questions, um, wanting to know if teams are going to happen. I have been telling them to register because I can't make decisions, you know, and, and make my recommendation to the school unless I have concrete numbers and I can't get those concrete numbers unless people register and sign up. Um, you know, so we're, we're following the guidelines. We've added some, a, a few stricter ones ourselves just to keep our kids safe. And um, I, I think they're all well warranted and, and good safe precautions to put in place. What about transportation, Eddie? So you can, theoretically, you can get 23 kids on a bus um, and do so safely. Um, as always, if a parent chooses to transport their child to an athletic event, they've always reached out and said, hey, can I take my kid for whatever reason? That's something that likely when Shane and I sit down and kind of continue finishing up this um, athletic handbook for the SU, that's something that's going to be encouraged. If a parent wants to transport their child to an athletic event, ideally that would be, you know, probably the safest way for them to get there. It's a big push to why I want to have two spectators per student, because as a parent, if I drive my kid to an athletic event, I'm going to expect to be able to get in um, and, and watch my child, especially because I've driven them there. Um, there are some schools that are choosing to not allow spectators at this time. Um, all of that information will get conveyed to parents. Um, once everybody, all the schools have everything finalized and everything in place, I will be posting it on the school's websites, the SU website, putting it in Team Snap so everybody kind of knows what's going on so that they know, you know, Mill River is not allowing spectators at this time so that parents know that ahead of time because that might change their opinions about things so um will there be any effort to like stream games online or anything so that community members or other family members would be able to watch i would love to say yes but that's finding additional people to come in and, and that it would be willing and want to do and help do that uh, mm -hmm. I have no problem doing that. I would love to be able to record games and, and have this stuff done and, and taken care of. Um, it, they're great tools for coaches to be able to use. They're great for student athletes to be able to see. Um, but again, it boils down to, I need to have a volunteer that's willing to, to come in and do that. Um, and, and then we can post it out. I, ideally, I don't want to share those publicly because I don't want some other team to gain advantage on our teams. Um, but, you know, we've set up YouTube channel um, for athletics and we would post in quarters of basketball games for kids to be able to share out. And basically, I told the kids that if their grandmother wanted to be able to watch that, they were OK to share the link with them. So, uh, you know, those are special accommodations that I'm absolutely supportive to doing, um, especially because we're going to restrict who can come and who can't be there. So, Reed, there's a great pathway. Ah, Yeah. Well, Heidi had a couple students who worked with her last year, uh, and there's a long history of uh, students supporting the athletic program, right? Yep. Oh, and I'm also just thinking about our community volunteers that reached out today. Yeah. And Ray's got nothing better to do. <laughs> That's 
Are we going to have Under Armour face masks for the students? Um, I actually finalized the order this afternoon for the two ply face masks. They are sublimated. They are not specifically Under Armour face masks because the, it wasn't the economical option. Um, and it also was not what Chris recommended. Um, so we went with what he recommended um, based on, you know, how quickly we can get it here. Um, and for the fact that it's also meeting the two ply um, recommendation that we're putting forth. So um, are you trying to like enforce colors and stuff like that? Or is it just so the VPA hasn't, hasn't said the VPA is not requiring that they match the uniform. They can be whatever color. Um, we bought gators because they're the the easiest thing for the athletes to keep up. Um, but if a student athlete came up and said, Hey, I'd rather wear a fast face mask that goes behind my ears, we're absolutely going to accommodate that. So it just has to be two ply. All right. Do we have any other questions about any of the COVID-19 reopening plans? Um, I guess how, I guess the main way we'll know if there's an outbreak at our school or any other school is just going to be through the standard health screening, right? Where they're going to be checking for temperature and, and things like that, right? We're not, uh, so no, I mean, I mean, so the way that this would work due to FERPA is that if a student has a temperature, they'll go home. And then the nurse team is setting up procedures around, you know, how we work with local medical professionals around that. That doesn't mean that we have an outbreak because the student has a temperature. Students have had temperatures forever. So if there was right. a student who was to test positive or a staff member to test positive, that would get reported here. And then the superintendent would work with the Department of Health around a notification. And then there'd be a determination on what we would do. And so whether that means closing a cluster, whether that means closing a classroom, or whether that means closing a building, and then that notification would come out from the superintendent's office. Is there anything though that ever kicks in? I mean, I don't, I don't think I've seen it in anything, but just to double check uh, where there be any type of case where a student is required to get a COVID test or is it always going to be sort of optional or up to the, the student or the family? So that's all about contact tracing and working with the Department of Health. And yes, the Department of Health can require folks to get COVID tested. Okay. And then uh, for the for the virtual the academy, I mean, is pretty amazing. At this yeah. Point. Yeah, I mean, I know, you know, yeah, I know that the governor's recommendations for higher education are a little bit different than the schools, so it's um, yeah, that, that, that requirements around the are very different. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for the virtual academy, I know we get our sort of update to the boards from the principals uh, when the virtual academy starts up is there going to be some sort of regular update from the virtual academy that'll go out to all the boards since this yeah, is sort of the SU is my plan is that Lindy will do a monthly report to the SU cool And not COVID related, but I guess uh, Tammy had a question earlier that I don't think I'd answered on the in the notes uh, about now that we've approved the uh, the audit, uh, can she then can she now include it? Yeah, so we will, Tammy. The way this works is the draft was approved, so then we will just post that we post on the, the SE final. website. A final copy. The fi yeah, the final audit gets posted to the SU, and then there's hard copies that are available at the central office that's required by statute. Um, I don't mean to be direct, but I am being direct. Do I include the link in the minutes or not? No. <laughs> no. Thank you. OK, any other questions? OK. We'll move on and go ahead. Oh, sorry. It's after it's after uh, public comment. I have something I want to bring up to the board. Okay. Was there anything in new hires? I don't see anything under that. Nope. Okay. So we're on to public comment. Is there any public comment?
Hi, yes. Go ahead, Alexis. Uh, Alexis Taylor Young, uh, South Burlington resident. I would just like to know, I feel like I got a good sense from the middle school level and the elementary level, but what is the high school doing to foster good mental health for students and also good social engagement? Well, Alexis, the, the, the high school is in a very different place than the elementary school and the middle school because uh, students in the high school are going to be going to school with 65 to 70 other students that they'll be seeing in the hallways and have the chance to wave to and change classes with. Whereas in the middle school and the elementary school, those students are going to be in much smaller pods um, and they won't have the chance during recess or lunch to mingle with other students. Um, what that exactly looks like at the high school, uh, I'm trying to wrap my head around a socially distanced mask break for high school students is one idea. How we make that happen uh, might not be something until we figure out after the first week of school and we, we see how everyone moves around. Um, we are also planning to do uh, weekly morning meeting videos, which were, we got a lot of positive feedback from students on last year. So since we can't have morning meetings to build student community and have student announcements and celebrations, uh, we'll do that from classrooms and everybody will just, you know, we'll put that on the projector in each classroom and, and people will kind of virtually participate in morning meeting. Uh, so those are some of the ideas that, that we plan to do. Uh, I, we know we need to do more, uh, but those are all in the works. I'm so sorry. I have to ask a clarifying question here because I don't think I followed you right. Are you saying that students are going to be in the hallway like they would in a normal school year? Yeah, so the, the high school, because in high school, students have to take English and math and Spanish. They can't be with the same teacher all day. So in the middle school and the elementary school, those students will be with the same two teachers for their whole academic part of the day. Uh, in the high school, students will go to four different classes, just like they do in last year's schedule. So there, there's a lot more exposure for high school students in terms of the numbers of contacts. We're not going to be able to, to send a pod home and quarantine them if, if the high school has some an outbreak, we're going to have to shut the whole high school down. Okay, adding to that, you didn't really answer my question about mental health support. Uh, so what are you doing for that? Because I know that was not touched last year. Mental, what do you mean by that? We, we have several counselors on, on site that work with students all the time. But what do you mean? making sure that students feel supported and that they know how to reach and get access. And also, this is a traumatizing moment. Psychologists have literally called this situation a traumatic situation. These kids have PTSD. Sure. What are you doing yeah. to support so, them? So Alexis, one of the things we did last year, and maybe this, uh, this uh, didn't apply to you, but as we became aware of, of student issues, either because a student reached out to a teacher or a parent reached out to staff, uh, we had staff who met twice a week and we ran through our whole student body list to talk about student mental health. And when we had concerns, we devoted resources to, to helping them. Uh, so we had uh, five or six staff members who, who regularly made phone calls or emails or even use social media in some cases to reach out with students uh, just to check on their mental well-being when we, they hadn't been heard from, uh, but especially to provide support when they were in crisis. Uh, and uh, we, we dealt with a number of crises last, last spring, and uh, I'm extremely proud of how our MTSS team handled those. Okay, do we have any other public comment? Okay, we'll move on to other. 
So Jamie, you said you had something? Yeah, so I've been under other bringing up to each board uh, whether or not they want to pilot the board getting together for an in-person meeting in September. Uh, you have two member boards of the ESU that have chosen to do that. It'll be a hybrid meeting. It'll be virtual for public. Um, but the board would meet at a location, a worn location. And we've tried to choose settings either outside or indoor that would also allow the public to come in social distance if they choose. The idea behind it is, is that uh, there was information from the VSBA that came out and said that to boards that you might want to not consider getting back to in person. But as your superintendent, the fact that we're moving back and you've got faculty coming back to the buildings next week, uh, and students, I think that you might want to consider whether or not uh, moving to at least pilot an in-person meeting would make some sense. Um, speaking for myself, I'm not, I, I, I would prefer to stay virtual just because like the best thing that we can do to keep the schools safe is by keeping the transmission in the community down low and so anytime that we can avoid in-person contact that helps that goal um, so I feel like these meetings have been fairly productive and I don't feel like the online format is particularly I don't know detrimental to our discussions um, I don't know what is it, what do other people think and I certainly I certainly would be fine with you know, if a hybrid format would let people go if they feel comfortable. And well, yeah, the, uh, the the other board that said that board members didn't feel comfortable, they didn't have to attend. And this right. is not something I'm trying to push the boards on, but it's something I think that it, it warrants a conversation at each board just to talk about. Sure. I, I could go either way with this. I mean, if I, I think that the in-person meetings offer a little more of a community sense and feel sometimes meeting through these platforms can be, it's hard to give it 100% of my attention. You know, there's distractions happening within the household kind of thing. But um, I also understand, you know, I guess, like I said, I could, I'd be happy to show up in person if that's where our energy went. Um, but I feel like these in-home virtual meetings have been productive. I liked seeing all the, the, the fact that our meetings are recorded. I mean, they always are, but they seem to be running pretty well. If yeah, if we went to a hybrid meeting, I mean, I would probably still continue to connect remotely uh, just to keep contact down. Uh, I know for me at Vermont Tech, we'll be teaching remotely uh, for lecture, but then we'll have lab weeks. Uh, and so I'll have to be getting tested the week before I have a lab week with students and uh, uh, so probably just to to keep contact down and uh, and make sure that I don't impact my my daily job uh, you know I'll probably still try to isolate as much as I can uh, you know I feel comfortable going out in public and stuff but uh, you know it's just to go to the grocery store and then come back home uh, um, but uh, uh, yeah I think just uh, for me and my family, I would probably still connect remotely. Uh, I don't have, a, I just don't meet in person. Uh, if it's outside, that'd be great in a tent and or, you know, where we can socially distance, but either way is fine. Uh, but I don't have a problem meeting in person. I'm a face to face person. <laughs> I suppose one advantage to getting together in person would be being able to see some of the, like if we met at one of the schools with some of the outdoor facilities that they have, might be useful to be able to see the school. But. We could teach you how to make a fire. <laughs> <clears throat> um, but yeah, I mean, it seems like if we're going with a hybrid I mean, we'd be going with a hybrid anyway because public would be remote. So, you know, if we want to change the central meeting location from the central office to one of the, an outdoor location or something else, then, you know, as far as like practically 
it would be about the same. Like a Bob in person right now, anyway, and um, yeah, just a matter of who's comfortable going, I guess. Yeah, I guess we just have to make sure we have a decent Wi-Fi signal outside uh, for hosting the meeting. You think we're good, right? Hmm? Do you think we'd be good? Well, we're, we're going to test this in uh, Chelsea coming up. <laughs> yep. We're good in Bethel outside. <clears throat> so is it the board, I mean, it, do you guys, is it your desire that I, uh, you know, warn the agenda moving forward, Google Meet, and that we'd be hosting outside at a Bethel campus to begin with? Yeah, in the past, to... we've swapped back and forth between Bethel and Royalton. Yeah. Um, we could just continue doing that unless there's a specific reason to just be at Bethel. No, no, I was just going to, just so I know which one I'm warning. I'm just making myself. Sure. Yep. Can I ask a question? I just assume that if we start board meetings uh, on our campus, that other community groups are going to ask if they can access the school. So I'm assuming that that ha isn't going to shift yet but I'll wait for more information on that. Yeah? Uh, yeah, no. This would be yeah, no. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I do think philosophically, personally, I think it's better to keep things remote, at least for the first little while as school's picking up. You know, I think the most important thing is having the kids have the option to be in school. And the safest way we do that is by, yeah, keeping the community as you know remote as possible <laughs> um, but anyway that's just my my personal preference right um do we have any other discussion on this or should we move on to future agenda items no i think it's good i got okay so do we have future agenda items anybody wants to add? Well, uh, by the time we meet next, we'll have accomplished one week of school. So um, I guess I guess that's not an agenda item. I, that'll just be part of the agenda, just letting us know how everything went. And But uh, we do have... I, I'm looking at the next meeting date, and I thought we had a um, a retreat scheduled for September as well, like the 18th. Yeah, during the same week. So, um, do we really need to have a board meeting and a retreat? Oh, did we we talked about that too, didn't we? We decided right. we were going to have both. Yeah. Yeah, I think the idea was that the board meeting will be for, you know, regular current events and the retreats more for overall planning purposes. Okay. We're, we're going to do a COVID update, of course. Um, we did, the VISBIT came and had reviewed your guys' grounds. Um, and that's something that I'd like to get on the future agenda. It could help inform the uh, facilities committee too. Um, and okay. just so you know, I say the boards is if, if you have agenda items that come up between now and about a week and a half before your next meeting, you know, and I, I plan these meetings with your board chair. So if you have agenda items, then Lisa and I can talk about them and then get them on the agenda. All right. It's probably on Jamie's radar already, but uh, going forward, we'll have facilities and finance or budget reports to present at the board going forward. Yeah, and you guys have your September, uh, the SU agreed to your September data point is social emotional data. So the principals will have that report in September as well. Good. All right. Well, our next meeting will be. Tuesday, September 15th. That's the
there's nothing else. So entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn.